Hello, everyone, and welcome to Nails and Beauty Talk. I am your host, Asia the Bird. Today, I have a very special guest with us today. She is an author and illustrator. Please welcome Raina Studios. Hello, Raina, and welcome. Hi, how's it going? I'm doing great. How are you? Good, thank you. Happy to be here. Yes, glad to have you. So I want to go ahead and get started by asking where you're originally from and tell us a little about your upbringing. Yeah, so I was born and raised in Miami. So I've been here my whole life. Um, and so obviously there's a rich, diverse culture down here, probably compared to to some of the other places in the States. So mm -hmm. um, yeah, I really, I love it here. I'm, I'm an island girl, so I love the weather. I love the color. It's good for the art. Um, yeah. Yeah, so really cool. Where's like your family from? My mother is Bahamian Jamaican and my father is Cuban. Okay, cool, cool. Now, what was like your school experience like? Grade school, college, things like that? Yeah, I mean, I, as far as like creativity and art pertains, I was really into writing as a kid. I went to um, just public um, elementary schools and mm -hmm. I was not very athletic. I was a gifted kid. So reading was my forte. I could read a book in like <laughs> a, an hour. Um, <laughs> so I just, I loved reading and I loved the world that it opened up and like the way mm -hmm. that it opened up my imagination. Mm -hmm. And so um, I wanted to create worlds of my own, you know, so I started doing creative writing really young, entering contests and winning contests, which kind of boost, boosted my confidence when it came to writing. And it wasn't until high school that I kind of rediscovered art and like my confidence in it and mm -hmm. in order to like actually give it a shot. Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. I want to go ahead and, and really talk about this other question. So did you have any other hobbies prior to art or was art something you always wanted to do? Um, no, besides the writing that, that was something like I wasn't, I wasn't really into sports. I wasn't really joining mm -hmm. clubs. It was like oh, okay. studying, mm -hmm. studying and trying to make good grades. Um, mm -hmm. that was pretty much my superpower. And so when I found a creative outlet, obviously it stuck because I was like, wow, this is a whole other world. Mm -hmm. Yeah, right. Absolutely. Definitely. So you mentioned in a podcast episode of Side Hustle Pro that your dad was a creative, which influenced you to follow in his footsteps. So what were some of the valuable lessons that your dad taught you in terms of art? Yeah, I think a major thing that I got to see with him being a creative was that he was a baseball player and an artist. And so his mm. art kind of reflected his interests. So his art was very like... Um, sport related mm -hmm. and it incorporated a lot of the things that he was into. Mm -hmm. So I feel like as I got older and I started diving into it, I, I came to it with that lens where rather than trying mm -hmm. to perfect somebody else's style, I would think of the things that I care about and I value and how I could bring that into my artwork. Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. Most definitely. So you start out, you started out as an art teacher. What was your decision behind being an art teacher? It was something that kind of just happened. I was a substitute teacher throughout college, um, and mm -hmm. I, I loved that because, number one, the schedule was very flexible. Mm -hmm. So that was good because I could kind of, like, go to work in the daytime, go to school in the evenings. If I had a week where, you know, there were a lot of exams, I would just not take on any um, teaching gigs and so the school came to kind of like know me and know that I was creative and, and mm -hmm. I was studying art. I was minoring art. I wasn't an art major. But mm -hmm. when the art teacher quit unexpectedly, like the week before school opened, they just kind of asked me if I would fill in for a couple of weeks until they found someone permanent. And mm -hmm. um, I ended up liking it so much. And the students ended up gravitating towards me so much that they just kind of like asked me to stay. And mm -hmm. I did. And, and, you know, it kind of changed the trajectory, I think, of my journey um, with art because, you know, I learned a lot from from being in that space. Mm, absolutely. So how would you describe your art style and where do you find your inspiration? Yeah, so my art style is very vibrant, very colorful. It centers women of color. Um, it's supposed to be something that is uplifting. It's supposed to provide representation for people like you and I um, mm -hmm. to just see ourselves in these settings and in these art spaces where for so long we have kind of been not included. Um, right. And so 
that I think I'm able to kind of do a little bit of that storytelling by focusing on where I see us and where I see us right. worthy of going. I can kind mm-hmm. of tell the story of like where we've been and the ways that we've been kind of barred from those spaces. Mm, yeah, absolutely. And and I could totally agree that black representation is very important because even when I went to art school, I went to uh, Savannah College of Art and Design. One of the requirements um, for me majoring, um, especially with any major, I major in illustration. So one of the requirements is taking art history and you learn nothing but white artists, you know, um, from different periods, Renaissance or the Baroque era or the um you know, the expressionist era and things like that. So, you know, and, and the artists, you know, that we've learned, they're cool and they have different styles, but you don't really hear about the black artists, you know, in history, you know, you don't hear much about the Jacob Lawrence, you don't hear much about those other artists, you know, Faith Ringo, who's another artist from the Harlem Renaissance. So it, it's just, I'm glad that there's more emphasis now on the importance of black representation in art. Yeah, yeah. I mean, if you the statistic is wild. It's like 80% of art that's shown in museums and institutions around the world, it's 80% white male. So mm. then when you factor in white female and then, you know, all of the other demographics, it's like very small, a very small portion is black artists and then a very small portion of that small portion is black women artists. So it's mm-hmm. um it's very important for us to kind of like navigate and and be in those spaces and show people what's possible because it is the faith wrinkle wrinkles and the micheline thomases that kind of like Mm -hmm. reaffirm that oh this dream that i have is definitely possible Mm, yeah absolutely most definitely i totally agree with that now how would you describe your art process like do you start off with thumbnails before you do the finished product like what's your art process Yeah, I think for a lot of my illustration work, I usually start with just like a feeling, a feeling that I'm trying to evoke, a feeling that I'm trying to inspire. Mm -hmm. And um, I'll start from there, just kind of thinking like, okay, like if this piece is about peace or if this piece is about joy, like what is the body language of someone that is experiencing this heightened level of joy or this heightened level of peace and kind of like go from there figuring out what I want to be in that composition. Um, And it it usually comes from plants and settings and colors that bring me joy and that bring me Mm -hmm. peace. Um, And so when it comes to fine, when it comes to like more of my fine art practice, it's more so trying to ask myself questions and answer them throughout the exploration Mm -hmm. of whatever's going on in that canvas. Um, Mm -hmm. So I enjoy that contrast as well, like the difference in the process of thinking. Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. I like how you play with bright colors because, you know, especially since it's summer, spring season. And the thing is, not only that, but also like the environment, you know, Miami, Florida, you know, the the beach type of settings, like they have a lot of bright colors, the blues, the pinks, the light greens and things of that nature. So I like how within your work, it's very consistent in terms of playing with bright colors. Thank you. You're absolutely welcome. I want to go ahead and shift gears and talk about business. So you have your own business where you sell your own prints, um, patent cell phone cases, pillows, journals, books, and more. What was the journey behind building your business? And were there any obstacles in terms of building your brand? Yeah, I mean, I feel like every stage has so many hurdles that you have to get over. Like looking back now, it, it seems so silly, but I remember just getting started a major drawback and a major question was like how do i even print prints right like Mm -hmm. how do i even source the quality of prints that i want Mm -hmm. who is going to do that for an affordable price because a lot of times like you can just google prints and you'll find tons of websites that will print your photos and things like that but they're catering to kind of like a um what do you call that like a consumer yeah market so it's kind of like okay if i I can't afford to order 11 by 14s for $20 because then what would I be selling them for um, when I'm only trying to sell them for like $35. So Mm -hmm. it became like really a struggle of just figuring out where people source these things. And and I don't think there's any straight answers. So I had to do like a lot of research on my own. I had to pay attention because, you know, 
I follow a lot of artists and I was intentional about following a lot of artists at that time that were doing those things. So every now and then someone will like reveal something about their process that will help me like, hey, I'm using this printer. Hey, I'm printing with this person. Hey, I'm doing these things. And I'll just have to kind of like take notes, order samples and figuring it out for myself Mm -hmm. Um, until I figured out and like got to know the world of drop shipping. And Printful is really good for just like kind of like uploading your artwork and putting it on things and selling it through your website. Of mm-hmm. course, there's things like, um, what's that thing? Society6 and Redbubble, but they mm-hmm. do all of the work. So you get to keep like a very small percentage, something like 10% of this, the, pro- the profit of this stuff that has your artwork on it. Um, mm. So I use Printful. But of course, over time, there's also that issue of like, I want to be able to control the quality and kind of customize the things that I'm making a little bit more. So now I'm kind of in that stage of figuring out how to like really develop my own products from like scratch and like manufacture them from scratch so I can decide the Mm -hmm. finishes and the different the different aspects of it. Mm, Yeah, absolutely. Most definitely. Now, what has been your experience in working with brands and partnerships and how do creatives network with brands to help build their resume and portfolio? Yeah, so for me, I think I focused on building my community first and kind of mm-hmm. like sharing my work, sharing it with a story. So I was doing a lot of storytelling, like just as I'm explaining to you what the art is for, I was mm-hmm. making sure that that was evident in every caption and every work that I was sharing. I was doing blog posts and all of this. So I think people came to associate me with this kind of like thought process and um, it made it kind of easier to connect the dots. So Mm -hmm. I also kind of tried to brainstorm what types of partnerships would be in alignment with me, with what I wanted to do, with the people that I wanted my work to touch and Mm -hmm. what those touch points were. And I started like putting artwork on mock-ups and just sharing it and being like, wouldn't it be so cool if I partnered mm-hmm. with Fenty to make this gift wrap? Or wouldn't it be so cool mm-hmm. if I designed my own underwear packaging or wine label? And so mm-hmm. that would get my community really excited, you know, cause they would comment, they'd be like, Oh my God, I would love to see this. They tag, they're tagging Rihanna, they're tagging mm-hmm. Fenty, they're tagging all these people. Mm-hmm. And um, although though that didn't bring like an immediate result, like Fenty didn't contact me like, hey, we saw your mock up. We want to work with you. But mm-hmm. it allowed other companies to kind of like imagine what a partnership would look like and how my work could kind of help amplify whatever messages they were trying to drive home. And eventually that led to these collaborations um, that, you know, lucky enough, they have contacted me and wanted to work with me. And mm-hmm. It's it's been kind of organic in that sense. Mm. I want to get into as far as nails and nail art. So that's one of my my loves. I'm a nail artist, and I've seen that you sell your own nail stickers in your shop. Now, how would you describe your style of nail art on your nails? Yeah. So for a long time, I fell in love. I fell in love with nail art, and I was going to these appointments. I would draw out the design that I wanted on my iPad. And then I would take it, you know, obviously I had to find a nail artist that was like down to try and like had the skills to do it. But I would take it to my nail artist and she would recreate these styles on my nails. And it was amazing. It was beautiful. Um, Mm -hmm. But it would take hours. It would take hours and hours, like Mm -hmm. three to four hours to get this done. And I Mm -hmm. knew that like, I don't mind getting it done if I have a photo shoot or people are going to see my hands when I'm drawing. So it's, it's worth mm-hmm. it. But for people who one maybe don't have however much it costs, 150 to $200 for like, if you're really getting like intricate nail designs on each finger um, for people that don't really have that and maybe don't have the time to sit for three to four hours, I just wanted the nail art to be accessible. Um, mm-hmm. So I decided to, try to manufacture some nail stickers which this is like my the one of the first products that i've actually had to source and do myself um mm-hmm. so these are not drop ship this is something that i had to collaborate with a factory to develop and you know work mm-hmm. through um and so yeah that's pretty much how that came to be like i kind of mm-hmm. have that that way of living and that mantra where I want everything that surrounds me to feel intentional and to feel like art. 
Um, Mm -hmm. And so my nails are one of those things. The way that I dress, that's one of those things. My earrings, which are usually more crazier than this, that's one of those things that, you know, I put some thought and intention behind because I feel like it uplifts my spirits. It Mm -hmm. uplifts people who I interact with when they see it. They're like, oh my God, so cool. Mm -hmm. I love that, whatever. And it's just, it's, it, feels nice it makes life mm. just a little bit brighter mm, yeah absolutely have you tried like press on nails before or you do like usually gel on your nails i use i've done press on nails but i think i'm a little bit too active especially like with my dogs and with the art like i can't handle it feels like more maintenance right because it's like if you mm-hmm. get your nails done you get acrylics you get gel it's gonna last you three weeks before you need like a fill when you put on press ons they're going to start popping off one by one throughout hmm. the week, you know? So then you, it's, it's just more time that you're just like, got to put this one back on, got to put this one back on. So hmm. I love them. And I've seen some such beautiful like styles for some nail artists that offer that. But I just know that for me, like I grab my dog and it pops off. So I can't. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Even with like, you know, long nails like whether it's press on or not, it could be hard to work with, you know, cause even with me, yeah. I don't wear, much um like no extensions or you no know, at all i don't wear any extensions at all um you know i like to work with my hands so you know i like you know having no no stuff with uh the no yeah. extensions or press ons and stuff like that you know i just have an easier way of contact you know playing with markers or different things yeah. i have to do so i like playing with my hands so that's easier for me I was going to say that it makes you feel a little bit disconnected from like, because mm-hmm. even when I am playing with paint and stuff, I can't get as dirty as I would like, because I'm always like, oh, don't mess up your nails. And mm-hmm. I always kind of hate that resistance of like, if I didn't have nails right now, I would really be in this clay or in this thing. Mm-hmm. Um, so I totally feel you on that. Yeah, yeah. Working with your hands, you know, doing stuff is, is a lot easier. <laughs> um, I want to go ahead and push forward and talk about um, pricing. So in regards to artists, there has been a lot of conversation in regards to pricing. What is your, what was your personal journey in regards to pricing your art and how did you develop confidence over time in pricing your work? So I think that, that like, again, I didn't have much guidance for that. And Mm. so I had to kind of do trial and error and I started from what people were willing to pay me, you know? So when I first started out and I was targeting like friends and family that needed mm-hmm. logos, like they were offering me like $50 for a logo. And so from zero mm-hmm. to 50, that seems like a good amount of money. So right. as I started building demand for that and it was no longer feasible to like do a good job doing multiple logos at $50 each because if you think of even a minimum wage job and like the time that you're putting in, like one, once it stopped making sense, I knew it was time to raise my price, you know, from 50 to a hundred, from a hundred mm-hmm. to 150. From there, as I got more experience too, and my work was proven, mm-hmm. then I also learned, I think I listened to a podcast that might've inspired this. It might've been um, Andy, Andy pizza's podcast, creative pet talk, where mm-hmm. it was like, don't just increase the price, but increase the value. So instead of offering people like one-off logo illustrations, I started doing like a branding package. So I was helping them pick fonts and then I was helping them pick a color palette. I was offering them three variations of a logo. So that Mm -hmm. took it from like 150 to 300 to 350, whatever. But it's like, I wasn't just jumping the price. I was also jumping the value. Mm -hmm. And from there, as you know, demand continues to grow and as things continue to grow, you kind of learn like, okay, like this, this has to balance off. And also I've put in five years in this industry and six years and seven years, I feel more confident asking for this amount of money because I know I'm going to deliver. Cause I definitely dealt with that in the beginning, the anxiety of like, okay, I know I can draw and I know I can make this thing, but can I really bring to life this vision this person is describing for me. And it's not until you've done it a few times successfully that you're like, yes, I can, you know? So Mm -hmm. I I allowed myself the time to figure that out. Like I did, I had the luxury of being able to take internships during college um, because I was living with my parents and, Mm -hmm. you know, like my car was paid off, whatever I was working. So I did do like art internships and things like that, that weren't paid, um, that gave Mm -hmm. me different experiences. But it's it's so tricky because it's different for everyone like not everyone can afford that and not everyone should be asked to do that 
but I've definitely taken my time and I've seen value in every like position I put myself in, whether or not the payoff was like up here. Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. And the thing is, when I went to art school at the time, like, you know, there was a sense where we learned about business. It was like the basics, but it wasn't in depth about the pricing, you know, and how pricing goes as far as your artwork and things of that nature. So even also too with the beauty industry, I like how now it's more talks about pricing because, you know, I think nail techs, you know, beauty professionals have a right to charge over a hundred dollars for a set of like press-ons or a, a you know nail enhancement service or a manicure pedicure service, you know. So because even you consider the time, you consider you know the complexity of the complexity of the design, you know the quality of products that you're using. So those factor into even with being an artist working on canvas or you know even if it's digital art, you know. So I'm glad that there's more conversations you know concerning pricing and people are understanding their value more, even with the nail industry in the UK, um, there's this organization called the Nail Tech Org. And what they do, they talk about, you know, um, the nail industry, they do nail courses and things like that. So they set up a day on April 8th um, last month, which is called Nail Tech Increased Price Day. So the thing is with nail techs and nail artists in the UK, they're earning below minimum wage. And mm. so what the day was designed to do was to encourage nail techs and nail artists like saying, hey, like you have a right to increase your prices because of the service that you provide. It's high quality, you're using high quality products, you're spending hours on doing a set of nails for each client. So, you know, I'm glad that now, like I said, it's there again, there's more talks about it and people are, are really understanding more of their worth and their value. Right, absolutely, absolutely. And I think it, it does get tough because we're in this space and time where everything is getting more expensive from like yeah. the things you can't avoid, like car insurance, health insurance, groceries. Mm -hmm. So it hurts a little bit as you start to see certain services like rise. But I always tell myself like one, if I can't do it for myself, I got to pay for it. And two, those people that are doing it deserve to make a living that they can afford these other things that are also right. raising in price. Um, because mm -hmm. I think about, I think about the hair girls all the time. There's no way you could pay me $300 to be in your head for eight hours. Like there's no way I wouldn't do it. So mm -hmm. when people are complaining like, Oh, braids cost this much now. I'm like, I mean, I know I wouldn't stand in your head for eight hours. So I get it. Like maybe that means I'm getting my hair braided less frequently, but mm -hmm. I would never like try to, argue with that because I, I understand it even with with my work and um, you also always have a better time with people that value you right off the bat versus people that are trying to like nickel and dime because mm -hmm. they they don't like understand the value of what you're doing they need mm -hmm. a service and if they need a service and maybe they need to like find someone who can provide the service but is less skilled or has less mm -hmm. experience and things like that mm. Now let's get into content creation. So for someone who wants to produce art content, what advice would you give to creators who are wanting to gain more traffic and engagement? Oh, I have a lot of feelings and a lot of them contradict. So the one thing that I will remind everyone is that like creating and sharing, it should be with intention. So mm -hmm. it shouldn't be with the intention of like, how do I blow up overnight? It should be with like, what is the community that I'm cultivating? What is the message that I'm sharing? Like, why is this needed right now? We have enough noise and it bothers me that that's kind of the way that social media is functioning. And, and that's kind of, now that it is like a profitable business for the people that own these sites, that's mm -hmm. what they want. They want us on our screens more, as much ads mm -hmm. as they can push to us, as much junk as they can sell us. And mm -hmm. I don't think that we need to contribute to that noise. Um, mm -hmm. The second thing that I would say is that before social media existed, it was harder for artists to get discovered. But artists have been making a living since the beginning of time. Like right. when I went to Italy and I, I was asking questions about Michelangelo, like they will have you think that these artists were living in squalor, but he was getting whatever the money conversion was back then. He was essentially a millionaire of his time because he was getting commissioned to do these large projects and they were paying him like they weren't paying him in grapes, you know? Mm -hmm. um, and so there is this idea that like, yes, social media allowed us to connect more 
and it made it easier and like all of these things these podcasts like you mm -hmm. you probably discovered me maybe from the podcast or something else so those are mm -hmm. good because it it kind of like um it shortens our degrees of separation but it's mm -hmm. not the only way and i think that people need to tap into diverse ways of sharing their work get out in the community mm -hmm. collaborate with other artists be of service to the entrepreneurs and business owners in your community join right. these like clubs and organizations and things like that like get people excited and talking about your work organically because word of mouth will never die. Mm -hmm. And then when it comes to social media, I think social media has provided a positive um, challenge of like getting creators out of their comfort zone and out of their head because it's so easy for us to be like insecure about our work and like overthink sharing and like wanting to keep everything close to the chest and private and i think the demand to post on social media and the fact that we can see that it works we can see that people mm -hmm. who post consistently and post good artwork can grow a large community i think it does encourage us to kind of like get out of that shell and like share our work and build that mm -hmm. community. Um, I also think trying to, cause I, I haven't really, I'm not, I let myself flow in seasons, but in moments where I do try to post more consistently, it's a good challenge just as a creative because it has mm -hmm. me creating more. Cause I'm like, damn, I need to create. Cause I need to kind of like keep this thing going. I don't like the mm -hmm. idea of like, I have to rush and produce something today. Cause I need to post every day. I don't like that energy, but I do like the mm -hmm. energy of it holding me accountable that like, okay, no longer mm -hmm. can I go three years without touching a paintbrush because in the back of my mind, I'm like, oh, like I, I have these people that enjoy seeing my work and I would like to deliver something new. So like, let mm -hmm. me get, let me stay in the studio. Um, so I'm not sure. I think I went all over the place with my feelings. I don't know if I answered so. your question directly of like, was it specifically how to grow? Yeah, yeah, the growing engagement and traffic. I think I think it answered the question. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I think community like think community yeah, first. Yeah. What is the unique story that you are trying to tell and focus on telling that story versus mm -hmm. like the numbers? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, I understand what he's saying. Come. Yeah, wholeheartedly. Yeah, definitely. Um, you can't be afraid of posting your work and things like that. You know, and I wanna really ask this question, like, what is your take in terms of the importance of copyright and getting an LLC? Because we've heard cases, at least I've heard cases of some artists getting their work stolen, you know, whether it's prints and things like that, and somebody, you know, puts it on a shirt and steals a design. So what's your take as far as the importance of just covering yourself, you know, as an artist? Yeah, I mean, you definitely need to have an LLC for those expenses and to just make sure that, you know, you're protected, you're doing your taxes right, get an accountant, like those business fundamentals are very important, especially if you're planning on growing and scaling. Um, when it comes to copyright, also very important, but we like as a community, we need to come together and kind of hold our lawmakers accountable for like adding some protections for us because in this mm -hmm. digital age, we don't have, like, if I go live right now and play somebody's song, they're going to shut me down because the copyright right. is that, like, mm -hmm. you know, sophisticated that they could track it, whatever. We don't have that same, um, we don't have that same luxury when it comes to our copyright. So it's important to have it should you come across an issue like that. But, um, it, it I've gotten in situations where like the amount of money it would have cost me to fight a big company that sold my stuff, it would have cost me more to fight it than to just be like, whatever, mm. you know, and like, right. a lot of times what will happen is that like, I'll have to have my lawyer send a cease and desist and they'll cease and desist. But when it comes to actually fighting it, which is like hours and hours of lawyer time, usually like they'll come up and be like well this is what we profited and it'll be like three thousand dollars five thousand dollars they'll be like okay this lawyer is gonna cost me ten thousand so i'm gonna have to just like just drop it and then let the cease and desist be enough and the money that they made from it like just charge it to the game um mm -hmm. so i feel like that's that's always very disheartening and mm -hmm. Personally, like I don't want my energy to stay there. So I, I have artist friends that are way more like diligent about it. And they're constantly fighting with people to take down their stuff. And, you know, I personally, mm -hmm. like if it's if it's not a major thing, I'm kind of like protect my peace. Like I don't want to spend the time that I want to be inspired to create just fighting with people because I didn't like the way they reposted something and they didn't tag me properly. Like I've just been like picking and choosing my battles.
Mm, yeah, absolutely. That's understandable. So in your perspective, what do you think about the growth of technology and the art world, especially concerning AI? I think we're going to have to learn how to use it as a tool and not as a shortcut. Um, I think we're going to have to mm -hmm. learn how to let it help us as humans and not take away from actual creative humans doing things that deserve to be paid and hired um, mm -hmm. to do certain things. So time will tell, like change is always going to be scary. And so I'm trying not to mm -hmm. be like afraid of it, but mm -hmm. I do, I do see that it's like, it's very tricky. I've seen a lot of artists like their work get stolen or put in these databases where the AI is like generating artwork based on their copywritten work without permission or without um, proper payment and things like that. So I think companies that are like utilizing AI, like everyone just needs to be, um, I guess ethical would be the word, you know, just mm -hmm. kind of like be mindful of the actual creatives that are using brain power. Um, to mm -hmm. to create the images that are now feeding AI because a lot of people like to think that AI just came out of nowhere. Like, no, AI is fed by our photos and drawings and art and the things mm -hmm. that are floating around the internet. So mm -hmm. a human brain still reigns superior. Mm, absolutely. Now, if you had a top four list of your favorite artists, who would they be and why? Ooh, that's tricky. Um, okay, favorite artists... Let me think. So Roy Lichtenstein, I discovered early in my pop art, like when I was discovering pop art. And I love the idea that like, because of pop artists, we have a less linear view of what is art. So I've mm -hmm. always been a fan of Roy. Um, also big fan of, let me think, let me think, let me think. I mean, I do love a lot of like the modern artists that I've, I've come across, like Michaelin Thomas, um, the illustrator Malika Fav. Um, I've always like, really, that's where I learned about New Yorker covers was from Malika's work. And like, that's what put that on my vision board that like, I would love to have a New Yorker cover, mm -hmm. um, illustrators like that. And then a fourth, I don't know why I'm drawing a blank because I have so many favorites. Jacob Lawrence is a fave. We mentioned mm -hmm. him. Agreed. Yes. Um, Kehinde Wiley, I think mm -hmm. a lot when you talk about like representation, the way that he's taken these like old English portraits and seamlessly put black bodies in those spaces in a way that it, it mm -hmm. doesn't look forced. It looks very natural. Um, and the scale at which he does it, I think it's very elevating and mm -hmm. um, very inspiring. So I would say I'm going to go with those as my top five for right now. Cool, cool. I want to get into fashion. So how would you describe the Reina Norega style and aesthetic? <laughs> um, so I think anytime I'm shopping on a website that has categories, I typically end up in the vacation or resort wear edit. So I feel like I kind of dress 24-7 like I'm on like vacation on some like beach resort. Um, so I love clothes that are colorful. I love clothes that have a lot of like patterns and bright colors, um, things that make me feel feminine, like big arms mm -hmm. and, you know, flowy skirts, things like that. And yeah, I, I feel like that like never ending vacation would be my style. How did you how did you find your style over time? Uh, I think finding myself, like really uncovering all of the like trauma responses, all of the like fears and, and different things within me led me to kind of like criticize my choices a little bit where it's like, okay, do you wear black because you like black or do you wear black because it's safe and because you don't want to mm -hmm. stick out? And like through learning to ask myself those questions, I was able to kind of separate what was me versus what was like learned behavior and really uncover what actually made me feel good. Mm -hmm. And um, it landed me here. So. Mm -hmm. Yeah. That's really cool. I want to get into as far as makeup and hair. Now, how would you describe your makeup and hair routine? Oh, so my makeup, I was talking about this on my social media the other day. So I've been natural since probably like 2012. Mm -hmm. um, and 
I love to change my hair. I love to change my hairstyles. I love to change my hair colors. And what I've learned that is that even with being natural, like you can, even without having a relaxer, you can still damage your hair by dyeing your hair, by straightening your hair. Mm -hmm. And so to remedy that, like I've always, um, I've always liked to switch up my style with like extensions or wigs or whatever. Um, And I think it's like just a quick, quick way to change a look. I don't Mm -hmm. like committing to anything that's gonna like take hours and like prior planning so when it comes to hair appointment and makeup appointments like i need to be able to do it myself and i need to be able to do it myself in about Mm -hmm. like 30 45 minutes tops like i can't do Mm -hmm. four hour hair days and things like that um so i think i like to keep it pretty simple especially with my makeup Um, i'm not a fan of just the way that foundation feels on my face and the way it feels kind of cakey. So I typically just start with like a tinted moisturizer or something like that. I like blush. Um, I have a contour stick and then you have eye stuff. So eyeliner, mascara, Mm -hmm. lip gloss, and make sure my eyebrows are filled in and and, um, call it a day. But I definitely Mm -hmm. like, I've gotten better. So if I have a photo shoot and I don't have a makeup artist, I can get myself there to be like photo shoot ready. Mm, yeah, absolutely. What are some like your hair, um, favorite hair and makeup products? Favorite hair and makeup products. So for my hair, I just started using Miss Riso's um, mm-hmm. Afro Latina owned brand. Um, what else? I think makeup I use. What do I use? I mean, honestly, I'd be in Sephora and I'm like, if it looks cute, I'm going to try it out. And sometimes it works out, sometimes it doesn't. I do (laughs) use a lot of Fenty. I love Fenty Mm -hmm. lip glosses and I love um, Fenty's highlighter Mm -hmm. and like how shiny they are. Um, Alamar Cosmetics is another um, Mm -hmm. Latino-owned brand. One of my friends um, started that. And I think just everything is amazing. The pigment is amazing. Mm -hmm. Um... And very ethically stores products. She doesn't do animal testing and things like that. She's very mm-hmm. big on that. So that's also important to me. And um, yeah, I mean, a lot of times I'll just use like the no name. Like I'll use like the Sephora brand eyebrow pencil and stuff like that. Because it's like, mm-hmm. I just need it to get me where I need it to, to, get, <laughs> to get me. Mm-hmm. Now, how do you juggle being an artist with mental health? I feel like they're intertwined. I feel like... Mm-hmm the intention and the thought that we put into our art like i put that same type of thinking into my actions and my feelings and my motivations Mm -hmm. and i spend a lot of time reflecting and i spend a lot of time like kind of perfecting my routines and process so that i can create sustainably and not burn out and so part of that is making sure that like my mental health is in check like i'm taking time for self-care i'm taking the proper downtime that i need when i need it um Mm -hmm. Yeah. So for me, it'll always be intertwined. Like, I think that's what my books are kind of like the way that I process what's going on mentally and internally Mm -hmm. outside. Um, And then my art is like the way that I'm able to imagine like where I want my mind to be all the time and like the way I want to feel all the time. So it's like Mm -hmm. a constant just like dance between between the three. Mm-hmm. Last but not least, where can people find you on social media and how can people support you and your business? Ooh, so you can find me <laughs> everywhere. I mean, I use my name everywhere. So Reina Noriega and um, it's at Reina Noriega underscore on Instagram. And you can support me by, you know, sharing the work, supporting the work, buying a print, gifting a print to somebody. I have lots of products. I have a lot of co- collaboration. So there's definitely something for everyone. I have my hair accessories with Goody. I have my wine with Cliff Family. So there's just, there's something for everyone. Yeah, absolutely. Well, thank you so much, Raina, for jumping on. Um, Your work is absolutely great. I really enjoyed our conversation, Um, hearing your story and your starting to art. Um, this, is re- this was a really cool conversation. Just thank you so much for jumping on. Yes, thank you for having me. Yes, absolutely. Take care. Bye-bye. Bye. Hello, everybody. Thank you all so much for watching. Please like, comment, share, and subscribe to the channel. Be sure to click the bell for notifications. Also, follow me on my social media platforms and be on the lookout for more interviews to come very soon. Take care, stay healthy, and stay beautiful. Bye-bye.